I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to a very special edition of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. I can't wait to get into this interview. I'm 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 starstruck. I've got to be honest. Not by Mike though. Mike, how are you? No <laughs> offense, but we speak all the time. How's it going? Yeah, I'm very good. Um, yeah, also like you, mate. Very very excited to get this episode underway. Got an extremely special guest. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a special one for us. Special one for the listeners as well. I'm sure. Well, our guest today is an Arsenal legend. He won the double twice with the Gunners. He's one of my childhood heroes. Uh, he's England's greatest ever goalkeeper, in my opinion. The Premier League's greatest ever goalkeeper, in my opinion. He inspired me to draw on a moustache at just eight years old and uh, inspired me to try, I didn't last very long, and grow a ponytail at the age of 12. It's none other than the brilliant David Seaman, welcome. <laughs> nice one, mate. What an intro that is. I love that you had a touch at eight years old. I was drawing it on with a felt tear. <laughs> <in it. laughs> My mum was absolutely livid. Um, oh, no, no. She, she'd find me with a black felt tip pen trying to draw her. Yeah, it's a good job you didn't do it with a Sharpie. Yeah, <laughs> Permanent <exactly>. marker. <laughs> David, how are you, first of all? And thank you so, so much for, for doing this. We, we really appreciate it. I can't put into words how much we appreciate it because yeah. it's not every day we get to chat to our heroes <laughs> no I'm, I'm doing well i'm doing good um yeah thanks for having me on guys it's um yeah it's just it's great to talk last night isn't it you know especially especially now we're top of the league for the world cup that was ace that was amazing like three points yeah. there you know especially when man city didn't get their three points it was i was like yay we're top of the league we don't even have to beat wolves <laughs> yeah yeah there was a bit of that wasn't there there was a bit of you like was kind of like if we win, this is huge. But if we don't, it's not the end of the world either. And and yeah. you kind of, it, it's dangerous, isn't it? Sometimes you can get in, caught in two minds. Yeah, you, you can. But um, you know, the, the way that we've been playing this season is is a lot different. You know, we're a, we're a more experienced team, and and we're playing with like with this different passion and confidence. You know, because I went to the I think it was the Fulham game at the Emirates, and we went one nil down. And I was thinking to myself, whoa! And then I, I was there. Obviously, I stayed and watched the the two one win. But um, yeah, it was it was like something different. It was there was a, a more, there was a confidence where I think last season at one nil down we might have panicked a little bit, but we didn't. You know, we just stuck to our plan and then got the win. It was brilliant. Yeah, for sure. I mean, David, can we get your thoughts on on the season so far then, and and whether or not you think that this Arsenal side are capable of lasting the distance and potentially? I don't even <laughs> want to say it. Do you think this Arsenal side can go all the way then? We've got a great chance now. You know, like I said, the, the belief we've got is different. Um, you know, and then what I do look at, I look at, I think to myself, well, I, we're like way more equipped than Leicester were when they won the league. You know, so we're playing with confidence. We've got that ability. We've got some great players. We've had some great signings as well. Even Saliba, for me, feels like a new signing. You know, the way that he's playing, he's come back and, and just set it alight with the, the way he's defending. So, yeah, it's Christmas now. Okay, there's a World Cup that stops it. And I think, you know, like we're starting to believe a little bit. You know, the only thing is obviously Man City. You know, they're playing really well. Liverpool are starting to get started as well. But Man City are, are the one I think that we need to keep our eye on. And we've got them to play twice. So that'll be a great little uh, a little test for us. Um, and the only the only other thing that might worry me a little bit is if we get a couple of injuries to our main players. You know, because we haven't got the backup that Man City have got, and it might affect us a little bit more. But you know, if this team stays strong and fit, we've got a great chance, guys. Oh, I don't want to start dreaming and then be disappointed. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to curb that enthusiasm at the moment. But um, David, a lot of Arsenal fans were delighted to see sort of pictures of you not so long ago on the training ground with with Mikel Arteta's men and with the goalkeepers in particular. What do you think has been the biggest change having actually spent some time with them out on the pitch and, and in and among them? Yeah, um, what's, what's happening now is that I'm, I'm going almost every week um, and, I, and I'm mainly with the, the under-23s and the under-18s. Um, and then I, and I chat to Aaron a little bit. You know, Aaron's got his own goalkeeping coach in uh, Iniaki who's doing a great job with him. You know, so it's, it's more of a mentor type thing rather than coaching. Um, but it's the same with the under-23s. You know, I go and watch them train and I, and then I, I just have like little comments to make here and there. And then sometimes I'll watch games and 
it's just like giving a little bit of input. Um, but I think with the goalkeepers, what you see is now is that, and I tell I tell the young lads this, and I say to them like, technically, at your age, you were way you're way ahead of what I was at your age, you know. But the difference is, I was playing. I was playing at Peterborough. I was playing at Birmingham City. I wasn't like number one choice. I was playing like one or two games a week. Then I went to QPR and I spent four four seasons in the top division there. And then I came to Arsenal, you know, so I've got a lot of experience. So that's the only thing that the lads are, the the, um, the, the young goal is a lacking is, is the actual playing time. But with Aaron, we've got a goalkeeper there that's got great experience, you know, and everybody says to me, yeah, but he had two relegations. And I'm like, yeah, perfect. Because that is playing under pressure. The, the pressure of relegation, trust me, is far worse than going for the title because in a relegation team, a lot of you are playing bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and if you play bad, it really make, it really highlights it. But when you're going for the league, if you play bad, the rest of your teammates can get you out of it sometimes. And I, and I and I and I say to them, I said, no, this this was great experience for Aaron. You know, because it's pressure. Now he's moved up a notch. He's joined Arsenal and, and he's playing under the the added pressure of playing for Arsenal, now is the number one, which is great. And by the way, I love hearing the Arsenal fans singing England's number one again, because that's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. You know, but he's he's doing he's doing really well, you know, and he's gonna he's gonna start pushing. He's gonna start pushing Pickford because you know he's only, I know he's gone to the he's going to the World Cup. He's only got three caps. You know, so that's a, a little bit of an inexperience for him, but Ability wise, he's got everything he needs to to really go all the way to the top. Yeah, you're talking about Aaron there. I think for me, he's been one of the outstanding players. There's so many outstanding players to pick from this season. Um, yeah. But but look, last season when he came in, I think you know no one expected him to come into the team three games into the season, displace Leno, who was the number one. That was just incredible the way he did that. Um, over the weekend, David, I was watching the game and there was an interesting clip that did the rounds on Twitter. Um, Arsenal were two 0 up against Wolves. And uh, Zinchenko dilly dallies on the ball, and uh, you see Ramsdale mouth to him, "Don't take the f in p." Yeah, you can you, you can make that up. And uh, for me, <laughs> yeah, you can you can make that out. I'm not really done well to disguise that there, I? But there you go. It's, um, it's not a family <laughs> show. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's we not know. a family show. <laughs> we, exa- we know exactly what he said. <laughs> yeah, you know you know what he said. But for, for me, as a yeah. as a sort of observer, I, f- I found that interesting because I think it shows his sort of leadership role, and that leadership role was sort of evident from early on um yeah just like how how hardly do you do you rate that and as an, obviously a, an excellent former goalkeeper yourself how important is that to have someone at the back marshalling the the back four it, it's so good that he's doing that because you know at that stage we were two nil up you know and the arsenal fans were giving it like every pass they were going way way yeah and then zinchenko got involved in it had a little touch too what too many and lost the ball and and but what I like is that Aaron's shown that much experience. You know, I'm saying like, right, we are, you know, he's stating the fact that, yeah, we are 2 up, but we can't take the Mickey yet. You know, so that it was brilliant. It was great to see. And the fact that he's only 24 is even better because, you know, he, he feels like he's got that responsibility and he's got that confidence to have, to have a go at, at someone that's, that's won the Premier League multiple times, you know, that's come to the club, new, new to the club this season. And he's a great player, but he's, He's got that confidence to have a go at him, and rightly so. You know, it's like, no, let's let's keep it concentrated, let's keep it tight. Don't give them any chance to get back into the game, and that's exactly what he was he was saying in a few different words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. But with with Ramsdale, you know, it's I think you know we're speaking to a legendary keep here, so we want to get your your insight on him. But um, is there so many? You know abilities that he has, David. Um, you know we talked about the shot stopping, the 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 ball playing. Um, what what do you think that he brings to the team, or is it leadership? What do you think is the most important aspect that that has brought a sort of sea change in in how Arsenal play? Because let's be realistic. I think you know Arsenal were always going to struggle until they had that keeper. Mm. Um, you know with that presence, with that ability. Um, so what do you, what do you think really that he's brought that's really impacted us the most? The, the biggest thing for me is his character, you know, is his confidence and the confidence he has behind the back four. You know, because when you look at it, when he first came to Arsenal, a lot of the fans were like, really? We're paying 30 odd million for a, a, second, a, a number two goalkeeper? You know, because everybody couldn't really see him taking over, taking over Burnt. You know, Burnt had great abilities, you know, 
he was a, a really experienced goalkeeper and did, did great for Arsenal. But as soon as he got injured and then Aaron went in, everyone saw a difference. You know, the fact that he can play out from the back with, with confidence, you know, not just like booting it or playing it sideways. He can pick a pass out as well. Um, you know, and then the arrogance that he's got as well, which like you can imagine for me, he's like, I'm like, whoa, just calm down a bit, Aaron. <laughs> you know, because I wasn't like that at all. You know, I was, I would have a little go, but not a lot. You know, I tried to keep it calm and collected at the back. But, you know, Aaron's got his way of being a goalkeeper. And, you know, if I can add a little bit to it, you know, or, or tell him, you know, when, when you know, he might need to calm down a little bit, then he's only he's, he's learning. And the thing I like about or love about Aaron is that he wants to learn. He wants to become the best. You know, and you can see that. You can see that in the way that he trains. His feet, by the way, are so fast. Mm. I remember watching Iniaki, the goalkeeping coach, took me into his room and he said, yeah, hey, watch these. We I mean, watch some video clips, and the way that he has little footsteps is amazing. Because then that enables him to move either side or move one way really quickly. You know, because he can adjust really quickly because he's not setting his feet too wide. You know, so he's, he's got that ability, and then the confidence that he's got as a as a goalkeeper is um, is really special. You know, and that and that oozes on to the back four as well. Footwork is massive, isn't it, as a goalkeeper? Yeah. And it's one of those things that I think unless you play goalkeeper, you maybe don't realise how key it can be in terms of getting yourself yeah. across the goal and almost knowing when to launch yourself into a dive, right? Yeah, you know, and it's, we, we all talk about trying to get set, you know. So ideally, we'd love to get set and then be ready for anything. But most of the time, we're always on the move. You know, whether a ball's been played through and you've decided not to go out for it, you're moving backwards. And then the striker might be running onto it. And then all of a sudden you've got to like try and steady yourself, balance yourself, and then make a make a decision which way to go. You know, and that's the beauty with Aaron is his his adjustments are so quick that he gets into position really quickly. You know, and that that saving we I call it saving on the move. That happens a hell of a lot in goalkeeping, and he's really good at that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And just another thing that that I've noticed is um I think Arsenal's directive from Arteta has been to kick the ball long as well. And obviously he's incredible at that. There was, a, there was a moment, there was a few moments against Liverpool, I think it was, when when Aaron was just pinging this ball out to Ben White over the top. And because he has full confidence in Ben White that his touch is going to be immaculate, he can do that. And yeah. when you're playing against high-press teams, that is so important. Um, but you, I think Aaron's game is lifted because the players around him have lifted as well. And you, you notice that a lot more. Yeah, you do, you know, and, and they're they're happy to receive it from Aaron, even even though most of the time, because as a goalkeeper, you want to make sure it gets there. It comes in with a little bit more pace than normal, mm -hmm. you know. But that's that's our way of making sure it gets there because we can't really afford to make mistakes. And with Aaron, he's got, like you say, he can play it out from the back. You know, he can do the short passes and the into midfield and that. But he, then he has got that ping. You know, he's got the ping that can either like find Ben White or or find Saka, you know, or find Jesus up front. You know, he, he's got that Edison ball about him as well, you know. So his, his, his confidence is brilliant doing it, you know, because you do need that. You know, when when I look back and I think, you know, of goalkeepers that struggled, you know, Petr Cech struggled with Arsenal when we first started doing that. You know, he struggled to get it out because he weren't used to it. You know, I just to think what I'd be like. I'd be like, I'd be great down the right hand side, but the left <laughs> side would be like into Rosette every time. <laughs> you know, but but Aaron's got that in his locker and, you know, he's brilliant. And then what that also does as well is it makes the, the attackers think twice, you know, shall, shall we all push in or, or the opposing team, like do they press in being aware that he has got that ball over the top, you know, so it's, it's, it's brilliant for, for Aaron. It's great for the team that he has got them options. Yeah, for sure. Um, another player I wanted to get your thoughts on David uh, at the other end of the pitch is, is Gabriel Jesus. He's come in and I think been, superb i think he's added yeah. another dimension to arsenal's attack but he hasn't scored in 10 games across all competitions he's still contributing massively but you just feel like that narrative is starting to build and develop around him is it something that you're concerned about in any way shape or form no no not at all because like you say he's it's not like he's like not contributing He's missing a few chances, even at the weekend at the bar, I think, you know, so he's just he's just being a little bit unlucky at the moment in front of goal. What he needs is a two foot tapping and that'll get his confidence back, you know, so come on lads, help him out, set him up, let's get him away from this 10 goal on, you know, like not scoring streak, but now, but when you, when you look at him, you see, especially the start of the season, you saw the difference that he brought, you know, as 
as small as he looks, he can really look after himself and he can really shield the ball. You know, we've seen him, we've seen him knocking defenders off the ball that are like almost twice the size of him. But what he's brought and, and Zinchenko as well, what he's brought to the team is two marquee players, I call them, finished article players, which were two great signings for the club because we've got a young squad, a young team, you know, and it's slowly getting experience, but they're now seeing, not just in games, I mean in training, they're seeing what it what it needs to be a, a league winner, you know, or a, a medal winner. Because they'll see the standards that they've got and then they'll be wanting to improve themselves to try and get to that standard or to show them that they can get to them standards. And with, with them two, I just thought it was perfect, you know, and they've had, the impact they've had has been brilliant, but the impact they've had on the rest of the team has been phenomenal. You know, and then you add to that, you add Jesus, uh, you had the Gabriel nearly there, Saliba. <laughs> <laughs> you add Saliba to that, and that is just like a brand new signing, you know, because he comes in a totally different player from when he went out on loan. You know, he, and but that's what I was saying earlier on about you've got to be playing, you've got to have match situations, and you you learn so much in games that it's it's invaluable because there's decisions you make in games that really affect people. But in training, you can you can like almost take a risk because you know there's no consequence. But in a game, there's consequence, and the experience that he's had from from being out in loan has been brilliant. And you know, I think all the Arsenal fans are like, "Wow, yeah, you know that now now we understand why people do go out on loan." Yeah, no, hundred percent, I agree with you. Um, I'm just going to bring up Aaron again because uh, David, I just cast my mind back to the advert that you did with him. In the, in the fish and chip shop. I mean, that, that's that's brilliant, by the way. Um, but it, it, for me, it sort of speaks of a, of a wider push from the club, definitely, to sort of rebuild that connection between between the club and the fans and the community as well, which is so important. Um, and I like we feel it. Me and Harry spoken a lot on this podcast about, you know, last season, even though we didn't achieve our goal, I, I thought the even more important thing was feeling that connection with the club again as a supporter yeah. because we we dedicate you know our pretty much because we work in the industry we dedicate our entire lives to this club um and, and and football so for us to feel that connection again is so important um but i wanted to get a sort of players perspective of you know how much easier is it if the if the team are sort of the the, the wind beneath your wings you know as it as it were can you can you really feel that yeah. in the in the dressing room you you can, especially when the fans are behind you, you know, and and a lot of that turmoil, turmoil came from like the last few years with Arsenal. You know, I, what I was watching, I, I just I didn't like at all. You know, where a lot of the fans turned on Arsenal, you know, and that was really toxic. Then Unai came in, and you know, okay, we I think we got to a final, but it, it still wasn't there. It wasn't quite right, you know. And then when Mikel came in. Okay, we won the we won the FA Cup in his first uh, his first season, but fans were still questioning the process and things, you know. So there was always unrest because they couldn't work out which way the club was going. You know, they felt it wasn't getting any better. But now, when you look at it, and I've been to a couple of games at the Emirates, and the the atmosphere is right back to where it was when I used to be at Highbury, and we would be chasing for titles. It, it, it's brilliant, and that really really helps the players because. Trust me, if, if someone's having a go at you on your own fans, it doesn't do you any good at all, you know, and it, and it, and it can affect your game, if I'm honest. You know, it's um, it's something that's... I can remember Nigel Winterburn, even, even you know, the amount of trophies that we won, there would be still people up in the... I think it was the West Stand at Highbury, and there, there was a couple of people up there that were having a go at Nigel, you know, and he, he proper gave it a bite. But, like, but I'm aware of it. While I'm in goal, I can hear these guys having a go, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute. You know, we're still we're still going for trophies. But that's the same now. You know, this, the thing now is that Arsenal as a club, and now they're embracing all the fans. You know, like you said, with the advert with Aaron, you know, that's been brilliant. You know, and your chips are and everything, and... I love a, a large Savaloy, and it, and it does it, it makes me laugh every time I see it. But it's not just that they've done it at other shops all around around the stadium, you know. And it's showing that the Arsenal come, they, they they care about the community, you know. And but the best thing now is that the fans are right; they're all on board now. They can see the process; they know it; they know what's going on now. And in in Mikel, we've got a manager that's. You know, I see him on the training field. I know the passion he's got. We've all seen a lot of the passion that he's got in the in the Amazon documentary. 
And it, it's just great to see. It's just great to see that there's someone there that is Arsenal. Because, you know, yeah. he played for the club, he captained the club, and he's now the manager. So he knows how it works. You know, and the, de- the way that he dealt with Aubameyang, for me, was the Arsenal way. You know, it was the George Graham way. It would have been, it would, Arsene Wenger would have done exactly the same. You know, your captain's messing about, he's constantly late and he's going missing and stuff like that. And it was, right, that's it. You can't do that. You know, and, and the Arsenal way was brought right back. And, you know, he, he, he felt that. But, you know, as, as good as a player he was, he, he can't do that as captain of Arsenal. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, David, you mentioned the, the Aaron Ramsdale uh, advert just then and, and stuff and, and how fun it was to make. What's your chip shop order? I've got to ask this. My chip shop <laughs> order is definitely just fish and chips and mushy peas, definitely uh, all day long. Lots of red sauce, lots of salt and vinegar, and maybe a little bit of mayo on the side as well. <laughs> I, I, I've got to say, I'm a bit disappointed you didn't go for a gherkin as well, just to... Yeah. To no, top it yeah. off. I don't know. Well, curry besides... sauce, David? No, not curry sauce fan. No, never been a curry no. sauce fan. No, wow. I'm just that's weird. And I'm a northerner as well. Yeah, as a northerner, I'd say that's pretty me. strange. I've been I've been living down here for a long time and I've I've <laughs> I've searched out a few good fish and chip shops, trust me. <laughs> One of the funny things was is when we did that advert, we were, we were like waiting for, for him to reset or whatever. I was like, Oh, hang on a minute, by the way, I need to try your chips. I see, because if they're not good, <laughs> I'm not doing the advert. And I tried the chips and they were raised, by the way. So, <laughs> And even Aaron had a few as well. So <laughs> we, we would Ooh, both bet, agree. Better yeah, not tell Mikel. A, <laughs> yeah. know, it's a good chippy, by the way. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, just you mentioned sort of Arsene Wenger and, and the way it kind of went south um, at that time and, and sort of the, the reaction from some of the fans. We've had a lot of ex-Arsenal players on this show over the years. And, and we always ask the question to the ones that have played under um, Mikel, uh, almost said Mikel Arteta under Arsene Wenger, yeah. how they felt watching that happen. Because oh. I, I was at the um, the premiere of the Invincibles uh, Wenger film not too long ago, and watching that really kind of I wasn't one of the people that was standing there calling for his head and all of that, but it really hurt me to know that yeah. a guy that had done so much for this club felt that way and was treated that way by Arsenal fans. So how was that as an ex-player, as someone who knew exactly what he was all about, exactly how good he was, to watch that and and to kind of, I don't know, just process it, I guess? Yeah, no, it, it was really disappointing, honestly. It was, um, you know, like you say, I, I was there from day one when he first came in and we were like, Arsene who? And we were like, ooh, that professor-looking guy's going to be our manager. You know, that, that's where he came from. And then to take the club to where he did. And the standards that he set, you know, like when, when I look back, I think, well, Arsenal's worst season was probably fourth, you know, and, and we're now celebrating that. Do you know what I mean? That's how, that's how good he was. But at that time, I don't know what it was that changed Arsenal fans. It changed a lot of them as well. And it wasn't nice being at the ground when he was there. And I just, I always remember thinking, this guy doesn't deserve this treatment that he's getting because he was so loyal to everyone at the club. That he wouldn't come out and and like have a go at the board and all that sort of thing, you know, because everybody thought he was in charge of all the money and everything, and he wasn't. You know, it was the club that was in charge of that. There wasn't money available. We had to sell a lot of our best players just for just to to make sure that the ground was all sorted out. You know, so he he did a, an unbelievable job in managing the club and keeping it up there. Okay, there was different promises that were made about moving on, and if we go to a bigger stadium, we go into a different. A different level, but you know, it but just in theory, happen. that was correct, wasn't it? In theory, yeah. that was that was the right thing. It was in theory, yeah. You know, because now you know, you look at how many people can get in the, at the Emirates. You know, compared to to Highbury, um, you know, it's just that we haven't we haven't kicked on. You know, and this has like been like our best season since then. I feel you know at, for the Emirates, where we've got a real chance of doing something. You know, and I've always said, I just I want a trophy to be presented at the Emirates. You know, because I remember being presented trophies at, at Highbury, and it's what made it's what made it Highbury. You know, all that experience, all them great times, and we just need a couple of them at at the Emirates to make it feel really like home. And but yeah, with, but with Arsene, it was it was it was sad to watch. You know, and I wasn't happy at all. You know, and, and I never and I, and I remember at the time, every time I went on TV or did uh, media stuff, I was like, no, you know, come on, Arsenal fans, just. Be be aware and just be careful of what you wish for, you know. Because if he goes, 
You know, and I felt this even at the time. I just felt that if he went, it wouldn't kick on from where he's left it. You know, because his standard was so high. Yeah. And as and as we saw, it didn't kick on. It got worse. There's no doubt about it. Even when Mikel took over, you know, you know, even Arsenal fans then were still having a go. But you know, in 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 Mikel now, we've got a manager that's that's got a great chance of uh, of getting. I want to say close to what Arsenal achieved, but I don't think anybody ever will do will be that successful in in one term. Um, but he's got a great chance of winning things with Arsenal. Oh yeah, he's got to deal with this World Cup break now, which is uh, yeah, just gonna yeah, be but tough. I know, but at least we're top for it now. You know, yeah, I, yeah, I remember, yeah. I remember last season, by the way, guys, when it went to an international break, we were bottom. That other team in North London were top. Yeah, <laughs> that oh. was hard enough to put up. Dark with. times, now dark times. Better. <laughs> well, I mean, just talking about mentioning the World Cup. Can you believe that it's what less than a week away now? It's mad. No, I know it, it is absolutely mad. mad. Um, now, now that the the last. Um, fixtures are done, you know. Like obviously, the weekend that's just gone by was. I I I, I don't know how I, how I would have felt playing in that, knowing that you're in the World Cup squad, and you've still got a game to get through. You know, you look at people like uh, Madison at Leicester who got a little tweak, and he was like, "Right, I'm taking no risk, bang straight off." You know, so like going into a tattle and stuff like that, thinking, mm. "I mean, if I get injured now, I've got no time at all to recover." Normally, you get about what, three weeks, four weeks to recover and then you and then that's when the World Cup starts and you're normally with the squad for about two, three weeks. Mm. But now it's like five or six days. You know, they, I think they fly out they fly out on Tuesday, I think it is. And then their their games next week, you know, so it's like a massive quick turnaround. But you know, I still feel it's a positive for England because we're not at the end of a really hard season in the Premier League. We're we're, we're stopping it halfway through. There's no there's no issues about being tired. You know they should be fully fit and raring to go. You know, so yeah, um, and sharp as well, right? Like they'll, yeah, they'll yeah. be in the in the the mindset. Um, just touch on England. I mean, it's a complete mystery. I think to the to the whole nation, what on how on earth they're going to line up against Iran uh, on yeah. that on that Monday. Um, but you know, with so many sort of contentious picks, I guess David, is that there's been a lot of things that have been said about the defense. What you, given everything that's that's happened. What do you realistically think is a is a good tournament for England reaching the quarters, semis, or do you? I think you really I think quarters is 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 good. I think we're we're capable of more than that. If I'm honest, you know we're um we've got great experience coming off the back of Russia semi final, the World Cup, the Europeans. We've got great experience in that now, you know. And and the, this was like a young team and a young squad that's now what five six years older, and they've had all that experience. So. I can't see there's going to be any problem with nerves because they know what to expect, you know. And as much as we haven't played well up to it, it's not about that. It's about turning up for the tournament. You watch Germany, you watch Brazil, you watch Argentina. Before them, when they're trying to qualify, they always seem to struggle. But come tournament time, they're right on it, you know. And it's um, that's what England needs to get into their into their heads is, is right right now. It's all about how we play in this tournament. And to be fair, you know, to play Iran is a pretty decent team, a, a pretty decent start, you know. So, you know, the team that he puts up in that one, maybe it might not be his strongest, you know, because he'd be, he'd be looking at players with little niggles or or injuries that are coming back from injury, you know, people like Walker and people like that, you know, like, is it a good time to give Maguire a little go, you know, to get his confidence back, you know, because he's not playing for Man United, you know. So, you know, even even looking at it, why not play Aaron? You know, yeah. I know it might sound weird, but it, it, you know, it's, it's Iran. Aaron's not played many games, you know. So does he play a really strong team, or does he think, well, you know, it's it's, it's difficult because you want a really positive start, you know, you want to get the confidence up. But you know, there's always like different tweets that you can look at. But yeah, it's just it's all about winning and, like I said, turning up in that tournament and playing well. Yeah, a couple of things with tournament football, you kind of want to peak at the right time, don't you, in terms mm -hmm. of building up to that. And if the Arsenal fans sing that Aaron Ramsdale is England's number one, well, then he should be England's number one. And uh, <laughs> we won't say anything further on that. Um, what's your take on the Gareth Southgate debate? Because, you know, I feel like he's had a really rough ride given where he's taken England. Because if know. you think previous to that, it, they've been nowhere near that level of successful. Yeah. And, 
you know, he he names a squad. He can't do any right. You know, everybody wants to pick holes in the squad. He play, plays a certain system. Everybody wants to pick holes in the system. I, I feel that there's a huge disrespect for the job that Gareth Southgate's done. There, there is, and you know, and it is frustrating. And but he gets it right, Gareth. You know, the, you ain't going to please everybody. There's no doubt about that. But I know what you mean. At the moment, it just feels like there's a little bit too much negativity coming from the fans and the media. You know, because like when you look back at what he's done, he's he's put us into a semi final and into a final. We lost on penalties. By the way, how, how gutted is Jordan Pickford? He, he saves two penalties in a shootout and ends up on the losing team. <laughs> But you know, we, but in Gareth, we've got a guy that, that people, yeah, and they, they keep talking to me about, yeah, but he's so negative, he's so defensive. I'm like, yeah, defending, that's what you do. Defending yeah. is an art, you know, you start by defending, you know, and then if you get a goal, then we can defend that lead. But yeah, it, it, sometimes it gets really frustrating because, like, we're all well, not, not you so know him as well, don't I don't, you? yeah, you I know him and I don't criticize him at all because he, he, he doesn't deserve any criticism. You know, even the squad that he's chosen is brilliant. And the other side of that is when you look at the quality of players that we're leaving out, it just shows you how good the squad is. Yeah, the you squad. Know, he... Yeah. No, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. No, I got I, I agree. I was just just thinking about when when you were playing, David, and, and and thinking about England teams of the past, and you'd see, you know, players from rival clubs, and at that time, you know, you'd have Rio and Terry in the same team, obviously rivals, Gerard and Scholes oh. and all all these players that you know, they they probably hated hated each other. Let, let's let's be honest. And then they they had to come together and, and and play for England. But when I look at the at the team now, they all just seem so gelled and you know mm. put together. I'm, I'm not saying the rivalries don't exist, but maybe they were just a lot less bitter than they than they were in the past. Yeah, I think like with with Rio and and uh, you know the lads that you mentioned after that, that was that was just starting a little bit because when I was there, it was. It was strange because it was like the Arsenal table, the Man United table, and then the others. You know, that was like where we used to eat. And I used to like try and make a point of like trying to mix because I, I just felt it wasn't right. You know, we needed to proper mix. But and, and to be fair, we did. You know, there was there wasn't, you know, any grudges going on in training or anything like that. You know, it was we were all in it together. You know, we knew that, you know, because we were under pressure as well back in my day. It was we were expected to win stuff and, and and we didn't. And the longer it went, the more frustrated we used to get. But, you know, then I was I was made aware of the stuff that was happening afterwards. And, you know, that's not right. But like you say, with, with this team now and this squad, Gareth's got them really organised and really together because when you look at it, the respect that he's got from the players is perfect and it's brilliant. And that all comes from the fact that he actually coached them at under-21 level as well. Mm. You know, so he was their boss then. And he's now took that onto the to the main stage, and you know, and I, I know for sure he he was aware of what was going because he was like on the others' table, if you know what I mean, when it, when it was back in our day, you know, and he'll, he'll be aware of all those little things. And I went up to um, St George's Park at the end of last season, and I was watching the lads train, and and then I went in on a team meeting with them and everything, and it was just like it was so strange because like I was sat at the back of the room, and Gareth was up there. And I'm like, this is like my his teammate. He's now like England manager. And, then, <laughs> and, I, and before all the lads came in, I was like, this is usual, Gareth, me behind you watching you work. You know, but, <laughs> but he does it so well. And he's got a great team around him as well. You know, the coaches that he's got are really good. Um, you know, and there's and you can see his attention to detail is brilliant. His attention to his attention tactically is fantastic as well. Mm. I think he's a he's a great ambassador as well for England in terms of the way he has I think built a better connection. We were talking about the importance of that with Arsenal. He's he's built that with a lot of England fans. I think he addresses some of the really difficult issues really really well, and that's that's not easy because you're almost having to cross the line between being a football manager and a politician, and and you don't really want to do that, do you? You're a sports person, but I think he does that really well. Um, just one final question, David, and then we'll we'll talk about your brilliant podcast and where everybody can find it. But we talked about the the World Cup being slap bang in the middle of the season and the consequences that we've talked a lot about the consequences that can have people being injured. There are benefits, as you say, players go there sharper maybe. But as someone who's obviously gone to a major tournament with England and it didn't go England's way, you know, when you come back, is it hard to kind of switch back into club mode? And do you think it'll be harder this time because they don't have that break in between? 
Because I can imagine, for example, Man. let's take 2002 World Cup, right? When England w- were obviously beaten by Brazil, you come out of that. How do you then kind of get over that or put that behind you and, and focus on your club? Um, it's hard. Well, it was really hard for me, especially after Brazil, you know, with uh, Ronaldinho's goal. You know, I'm, I'm he didn't mean that, by the way. He I know mean. he didn't. We still went in. <laughs> that's the most frequent question I'm asked. Did he mean it? And that's my answer. I know he didn't mean it, but it still went in. <laughs> but, you know, but like coming off the back of that and then coming home was really difficult, you know. And luckily, when, when we landed at Heathrow, there was loads of England fans there and they all started shouting my name, which was, trust me, a massive relief because I didn't know at that time whether I was going to get treated the same as David Beckham did in 98. You know, so there's them sort of things go through your head when when it's on a negative side. But then rewind that to like Euro 96, and I'm coming back and I can't wait to get back to the club. <laughs> I can't wait for the season to start, you know, like to see all the Arsenal fans and have them all shouting money. You know, and then you go into away grounds and they're applauding you out, you know, which is what happened with the England players. You know, they got to the final, then the next season, they're getting applauded no matter what ground they go to. You know, and that's that's the the difference of of a good campaign with England and and a bad campaign. Um, yeah, it's um it's gonna it's gonna be interesting and you know, when when it's when you've done well, you know you've done well. You know, if England get, like we said, to the quarterfinals or the semis, then you know we'd be we'd be happy. But I've always said it: I, I want to be around when England win a trophy because I know it's going to be one hell of a party. You know, and yeah. I want to be around for that. You know, and it's um, it's been a long time. You know, I was I think I was three when when they won it last time. You know, it's um, it's a long time ago, but it's a uh, you know, we saw what happened with the Lionesses as well, you know, and it was and it's just great to be around and great to be in England when England are doing well on the football field. Absolutely. Uh David, talk to us about your podcast. Seaman says it's a cracking podcast, uh brilliant show with some incredible guests. And um people just watching this will see what a, a great sport you are, and I'm sure we'll be uh flurrying over. We will leave the link in the description uh Perfect. for those of you. Uh, to click on it and jump over. But tell us a little bit about it, how it started, how it came about and, well, and where it, it is today. Yeah, well, it, it started with the Euros, you know, and I got approached um, by a listening dog and they said, oh, do you fancy doing the podcast for the for the Euros? And I was like, oh, I, know. I didn't really know whether I would like it and whether I could do it. And then we did a few of them and then I was like, well, I'm, I'm getting into this a little bit, you know, and then obviously with what happened with the Euros, it was brilliant because it went on for longer and longer. And then at the end of that, they asked me if I'd do a, a full Premier League and I was like, Okay, and then then I realised I'm going to like start watching a lot of football <laughs> because we you know we do a review a, a pre a review of this of the weekend's games and then we preview what's coming up and we do a match prediction and all that sort of thing. But if I'm on, I'm really enjoying it, you know, because in it, and it surprised me, you know, because it's not it's not easy. And then and then and then having to like interview like interview a lot of my mates, you know, and I've been calling in like lots of favours. I've had like Robbie Williams and I've had Russell Brown. I've, had, I've even had Piers Morgan on, and I was asking him questions, which was ace because I could tell him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've had all the all all my ex team, you know, like loads of my ex teammates on, you know, and Jazza and people like that, and all the Arsenal lads. They they're coming on and they've been on. I'm going to get Tony back on after his exploits on the. Uh, Strictly, but um, yeah, it's just something that I've really enjoyed, and yeah, I, I long may it continue because I'm having good fun doing it. What do you think of, of the whole? What have you learned about the whole podcasting world? Because obviously, we do it, and and for me especially, I know Mike was sort of working in the world of production and stuff, but for me, this has given me a, a pathway into having a career where I only cover football for a living, which is ultimately what I've dreamed of right. um, when I was in a job that I didn't really enjoy or like or particularly care about. So what have you made of, of the kind of podcast world and, and how good is it in terms of connecting the fans to football and, and the freedom of being able to make whatever content you want is amazing, isn't it? Well, it, it is because like, especially when you interview ex-players or current players, you know, they, they on podcasts, you seem to relax a little bit more because you know, so long as the player doesn't feel like they're that the guys that are doing the interview are out to like stitch them up, like like dropping in a dodgy question or anything. And I think the fact that, you know, like ours is obviously pre-record, you know, and I always say, you know, if there's if there's anything we say that you don't want in, just say I'm not happy with that, you know, or let's redo that bit, you know. So they're they're more relaxed than being in front of camera and media like live, where they know that everything they say can be taken a different way. 
But I think I just end, I really enjoy the interviewing side of it now. You know, getting to know what how much people love football and one of my favourite questions to Arsenal fans or ex Arsenal players and that like I always say, right, one answer, Burkham or Henri. <laughs> and he gets them every time. <laughs> you know, they're all like, Oh no, I can't believe you asked me that. You know, but um, you know, it's it's just it's just nice to see like players, not well, not even eight players, you know, people like Robbie, Robbie Williams, you know, how much he knew about football really amazed me. You know, because he watches it all the time. And when he was living in America, he was saying, I get I get a choice of all the three o'clock kickoffs as well. Hmm. You know, so he, he was loving it. And he, and then he was like, and it, that all came around through Soccer Aid. So I was I was doing Soccer Aid with Robbie and we're on the coach and I was coaching at the time, you know, because I've stopped playing. And um, and he says to me, he says, oh, you, you know, what are you up to now? And I says, oh, I'll do bits and bobs and I do a pod, I do my own podcast. And he went, what do you mean you do your podcast? I said, I do my own podcast every week. He's like, what, you do your podcast? I went, yeah. He went, I want to come on it. And I was like, oh, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> and it, so, you know, yeah. it just happened like that. You know, and that's yeah. what's happening now is like when I'm out, you know, if I go to like premieres or whatever it is, you know, where you, where you go, like charity events. And I see some of my friends are like, oh, do you fancy coming on the podcast? You know, and it's, that's how it works, you know, and, it, and, it, mm. and it's brilliant. And like you say, it's great for the, for the fans to see them as well, you know, to see people in a different way of life, you know, but they're, they're I don't know what it is, but they seem more normal on podcasts. You know they've they've not got those guards up. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's different to traditional media in that, as you say, it is a bit more relaxed. It is a bit more chilled. You're not, you know, you're not fearing that every word that you say yeah. is going to be taken out of context, or that, or well, nowadays you do get headlines out of them sometimes. To be fair, yeah, but it's it's still um it's still a much more comfortable environment i would say uh but david where can people uh access seaman says it's a brilliant show that you do uh with lindsay hooper as well yeah so, with, um, with my co-host lindsay hooper and she's brilliant by the way because she knows like a lot more about football than i do <laughs> she's really good but no it's on all on all uh podcast websites you know just type in and go on youtube type in seaman says and, it, and everything will come up there you know so it's um yeah it's just something that's just I hope you know it's getting bigger and better and I'm enjoying it even more you know so long may it continue brilliant David thank you so so much honestly can't put into words how grateful we are uh, for you coming on today the link to Seaman says will be in the description make sure you go over there and subscribe and follow it on whichever podcast platform it is that you prefer leave them a review as well a good one you don't even have to listen to it first <laughs> just leave them a review you know the drill by now and um thank you so much mike thank you so much uh, for joining me as always uh, the brains behind the operation mr mike stavrio over there uh thank you guys so much and we'll be back soon with more until then take care I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.